Thank you, first of all, to all the people from Share Festival for giving us the chance to be here today. And um, my name is Marco Mancusa. I'm director of a project called DigiCult. And uh, here today with me, there are four other uh, professionals and um, journalists, critics, um, how to say, uh, connected to the network um, of DigiCult. Here are Sabina Barcucci, Alessandro Delfanti, and Bertram Nissen. Uh, we have four of the uh, five, six curators uh, that has worked on this publication, special publication, which was commissioned by MCD. MCD is this uh, French printed magazine, which was something quite new for us, quite exciting for us, because we are only online. So for the first time, we had the chance to publish um, something concrete, I mean, something printed. and. Um, MCD means Musique et Culture Digitale, my French pronunciation is, is horrible, and um, they, they asked me personally to uh, create a special issue, um, the number 68, that was published the last September, and um, um, they, needed a, they needed a strong idea, and that was the original, <laughs> the original concept, I mean, that's of course very, very general, but they needed a very strong idea, very actual idea, because uh, they needed to, 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 to speak about which also could be the possible steps and uh, developments connected to the, uh, to the use of digital technologies. And um, after a lot of discussions that personally me and Bertram, also with some other people in the network we have having during these years connected to the open technologies, we decided to focus the attention exactly on the open technologies. This is the French title, La Culture Libre, this is the English title the open future, uh, because of course the, the, the magazine is, is divided in two languages, so it's half in French and half in English. Of course we provided the English texts. And um, the idea from the very beginning was to have um, a very <clears throat> general approach, um, without being too superficial, uh, but being general was our main idea as from digital tradition, to be not focused only on some disciplines means um, art or design or whatever, but to be more general as possible, to, to, to touch um, different disciplines connected to the use of open technologies. And that's the reason why um, we decided to have five sections. And uh, personally, I created together with Claudia D'Alonso that uh, hadn't the chance to be here today, the um, video and audio visual section. Sabina Barcucci created the design section and architecture. Um, Alessandro Delfanti curated the, the, the science and bio art section, and Bertram Nissen the internet and social uh, technologies section, and there is another one curator, the last one is Elena Bizerna, uh, that is missing today because she's in London, she didn't have the chance to be here today, that curated the sound and uh, music section. So. Um, as you can understand from this very short presentation, the very general idea was to uh, try to um, have a strong research or um, a deep research, more than strong, a deep research, even if in few pages, um, about uh, the impact of the open technologies on uh, uh, what we consider the five main disciplines, both in terms of creativity, but not only, in terms of social impact of open technologies, also applied to some um, branches like science that sometimes are not um, connected too much to what is art today or what is design or what is video and audiovisual and music. Um, is a, we think it's a, is a, is a publication that could be referred to many, to many different kind of audiences also. Uh, we think that different kind of people from different background, backgrounds could be interested in such a publication, especially because the, the fil rouge, the main connection, is the use of those technologies that are absolutely common and uh, will be. Uh, present in our lives more and more also in the upcoming years, even if this is probably a point that we want to touch also with you after the end of our short presentation. So, um, yeah, um, for the moment nothing more to say for the very, very general beginning. I want to leave the, the stage to, to, to Sabina that, would st that we start to, or to Bertram, that we start to discuss about his section, the Internet and Society one. Uh, okay. So, 
thank you for inviting us, first of all. Uh, some, some, some words on, on the, yeah, please, on the internet and digital cultures uh, section. Um, so the, the, the attempt here was to reflect on the um, nature of creativity, or better to say, on, on, the, on the rhetoric of creativity, on the digital myth of, of creativity that has been pushed heavily both in journalism, in, in policies, and, uh, and also in academic research in the last 10, 15 years um, by many scholars. Firstly, Richard Florida, which is the most well-known. Um, and uh, so creativity, the point is that has been used as a, as a tool for, for urban planning, for policy making, for, um, let's say, as, a, as an instrument to shape uh, the way we think about the relationship between uh, work, society, and uh, digital technologies. Um, so, in this section, basically, I ask it, first of all to Adam Arvison, uh, who is a sociologist from, uh, uh, from Milan, to um, write an essay about the research we did together in Bangkok uh, two years ago. Uh, so Adam wrote this uh, toward creative mass chapter or article that focused the attention on the uh, new, um, what, what in Bangkok, they used to call the Bangkok Creative City, but uh, that, as we have seen, it's something very different from uh, what we used to define as a creative city in Europe. Uh, because the creative city in Bangkok is basically a huge peer-to-peer -peer hub of um, manufacturing and bottom-up design that interchanges uh, know-how, um, science, and symbols all over the city. So uh, it's more near to what we can define as an uh, open hub than uh, a creative city uh, based on traditional creative industries here in Europe. In the second uh, article, I made this double interview to uh, Gert Loving and Michel Bowens. They are two of the most interesting and outstanding uh, researchers that are uh, working on um, digital activism in the last uh, 10, 15 years. And it was interesting because they have notably two very different approaches to digital creativity and to the use of digital tools for, uh, for digital activism. Uh, because on one side, Gert Loving uh, is well known for having refused to um, be uh, on the social networks. So two years ago, he removed his Facebook account, uh, also his Twitter account, because uh, his research um, approach to a, a strong critique of social networks and contemporary uh, exploitment, basically, of um, the emotional labor on the web. So uh, in order to be coherent, he decided to, to, to cut out uh, completely all his uh, social network accounts. On the other side, uh, Michel Bowens um, and the whole network of the uh, Foundation for the Peer-to-Peer -peer Alternatives, which is uh, the foundation that he created some years ago, uh, are deeply involved in the use of any possible tool for uh, social networking and, uh, and communication on the web. So basically, uh, I make them not properly fight, but discuss uh, this, this, this difference that on the other side is probably what is at the core of the main debates today uh, related to the relationship between privacy on one side, so the data ownership in social networks, digital creativity, and emotional labor. This point of the emotional labor probably is the thing that it's most, uh, let's say, under the level of the radar in the public debate, but it's one of the hot topics in the academic debate. So uh, here the, the attempt was to, to try to let emerge and to popularize a bit this concept. Basically, emotional labor is uh, the degree of involvement that uh, users, uh, especially users are related to creativity, to creative jobs like web design, art design, uh, architecture, uh, and so on. 
uh, is the degree of involvement, of personal involvement, of emotional involvement that they have with uh, some parts of their jobs that are not uh, rewarded uh, in a, strictly in an economic way. And many authors, include Loving, uh, see this kind of uh, involvement as an exploitment. So it's a hot topic. Probably this is not the best place to, to talk about it because uh, it's a bit too, too academic, but what we have tried to do is, is to make emerge this, uh, this difference. The last article uh, called The Corporate Paradox was an interview with Philippe Gren, which is um, a French activist for, for the open source uh, on the web and more generally for uh, free culture. And he's the, the one of the founders of La, La Cadrature du Net, uh, that is uh, probably the, the main French group of uh, digital activists uh, working especially against SOPA, which is, um, let's say, the, the, the new legislation that uh, enclosed the net for people that download illegally uh, files from the web. So. Um, there are these three very different um, views on the topic. So on one side, uh, uh, one that is more based on the urban frame, uh, the other one which is more on activism and social networks, and the last one which is more based on, um, let's say, copyright uh, policies. Um, maybe we can discuss a bit more later during the questions or whatever. Okay, well, thanks again for inviting us. And I curated this, this uh, section on, on uh, science, uh, bioheart, biohacking, and, and uh, the influence of peer production into science. So there are two types of open science, let's say. One is kind of well known, is, it is the possibility of a more productive uh, way of conducting scientific research. That's something that, that's happening in universities and, and corporate laboratories, laboratories and so on. So scientists are more and more using online cooperative tools. And that's, that goes without saying, in a way. They're doing what anybody, about anybody else does. Uh, the second, let's say, uh, form of open science is a science that's open in the sense that it opens its, its boundaries to, to, to be, to be more, more inclusive. So. Uh, not only white coats doing science, but, but citizens and uh, hackers and uh, um, students and kids that want to uh, conduct scientific research in an independent, autonomous way outside the boundaries of scientific institutions. That's what this, sections, uh, this section talks about, more or less. Uh, it has a focus on, on bioart, because it was interesting for this very peculiar um, uh, publication we, we, we made. Uh, but there, there is something more than that. So we have a couple of examples here of people, of collectives that perform science in a very in a weird uh, and uh, in a weird way, uh, directed towards like, a, like a, an artistic, like artistic goals. So we have uh, Acteria, which is this this uh, European pan-European collective. I want to say that's oh, the other way around. Excuse me. Uh, that is based both in Europe and in S Southeast Asia. And they do very fun thing with science. So the, the, their point is to provide people, even even on the street, with tools they can use in order to in order to perform basic experiments. For example, they build this very fun food truck in Indonesia uh, that people can use to uh, do like molecular molecular gastronomy, or for example, to test their food if if they want to find out what, if there are chemicals they don't want to to eat with their food and so on. And the other example is uh, La Payas, which is a biohacker space. So you, all, all of you are familiar with, with hack labs and hacker spaces. So physical spaces where you gather machineries and tools and competencies and intelligence and you share them. So hackers gather there in order to, be, to, be, to, to find uh, tools they can use together in order to share their, their knowledge. So the less more or less is, is happening in, in biology. So people are setting up these, these new labs where you can find open source tools and machinery uh, to perform basic experiments again. So for example, you can test something to test the food in order to, to find out if it, if it is genetically modified or not, for example. Or you can 
That's what the other things they do is you, you can okay, produ produce artworks using, for example, gen genetically modified bacteria and so on. Uh, so the question here is, is there a shift happening in the power over information and knowledge in the scientific field that people have? Uh, it's, it's a very fun and inter interesting question. So what, 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 what's going to happen when people, or if people, will have a uh, way to control their medical data and read them, share them, and work on their, their data together with, with, with communities, for example? Or what if we, will, if, we, if we would be able to, if we were able to uh, test the environment, like in, in very close to our houses, for example, for uh, mm, chemicals or pollution and so on? Uh, so is, is a distributed science gonna, gonna, gonna emerge from this new wa wave of machineries and tools and inform scientific information that are available to almost everybody? Uh, so there's a very ambivalence and ambiguity here. That's the point of this issue, and that's, that's what perhaps the other, the other piece shows very well, which is this, uh, this uh, editorial by the Critical Art Ensemble. I don't know if you are familiar with them. It's, it's, a, it's, an artist, it's a bio artist collective that was very active in the US in the 90s and, and 2000s, and uh, that has a very, as the, their very name says, they, they have a very critical approach to, to, the, to, the, to the biomedical industry. Uh, so they, they highlight here this, this very ambivalence and ambiguity. So okay, if we, if we give tools to more, to, more, to more people, we will have more people using them in unpredictable and unexpected ways, and perhaps unexpected outcomes, interesting and unexpected outcomes. Uh, perhaps science will be, will, will be democratized in a way. So more accessible, more shareable, more democratic, more easier, even easier to, to perform. On the other way, this, as, as Bertram said, this, this very ideology of distributed creativity informs what, a, anything we do online, more or less. And it's, 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 it's been exploited. For example, in the biomedical field, that's not that common in Italy right now, but it is in the US, for example. So you are asked to share your biomedical data and information um, uh, within platforms managed by companies that exploit your data in order to perform research that they can then sell to, buy, to Big Pharma, for example. Uh, so this very, this very ambivalence is, is, in a way, emerging in this new field of uh, open or do-it-yourself or biohacking science, or whatever you want to call it. Um, so that's what I tried to, to highlight with this, with this section, and we can talk about this later. The design section, um, it's uh, focused on experimental design uh, and uh, um, it's focused also on how this new way of thinking uh, related to open uh, culture and sharing culture and bottom-up processes in general, way of thinking, are helping to develop the um, experimental design in general. We are talking about uh, a design that is dealing with complexity, questions uh, traditional methods of designing, and uses new uh, digital tools. Uh, so to, uh, to understand how it's, uh, how, how it's changing uh, the field of design and the most advanced um, expression of it, we have first to understand how we currently shape how we currently build and how we manage design. And for this reason, I ask you to three different um, persons to uh, let me understand how we are building, how we are shaping, and how we are managing design production in general. So first, to, um, to the first point, how we build, and I'm talking about computational architecture, for example, um, biomorphic architecture. So everything comes from, for example, um, a digital-based approach. Um, so I want to ask, so I ask you to uh, Professor Nobel Palt, which is a chair of experimental design of the um, uh, Academy of Art of Berlin, uh, to um, give us an extract of his PhD, which is focused on tunable materiality. Uh, on uh, addictive fabrication methods. 
So what it mean um, addictive fabrication? It's uh, an, uh, <laughs> uh, a technological apparatus that help that allow to connect uh, digital um, computational models to uh, machines. But uh, the most advanced uh, uh, revolution that we can have in terms of material is that we can uh, completely customize um, performance of materials. So uh, in general, in construction, for example, the, every material is standardized and, and calculated. So steel, it's completely industrial steel, is calculated. But um, every uh, steel we can find, industrial steel, it's standard. So performance of the material are standards. And what material can do, it's standardized. So we have uh, architectural components that are thought on the standardized performance of material. Um, with new addictive fabrication uh, uh, technology, all this uh, freedom of uh, creation, of thinking, also spaces and architectural component. So there's a new story uh, that is starting right now with ne these, uh, those new technologies. A new story of architecture, a new story of behavior of materials that can, in a way, let us to think about an architecture more focused on human behavior, human needs. So we have. What uh, Pulse says is that, uh, okay, right now we have understood that it's possible to do, it's possible to develop new materials, a new architecture, so on, but uh, actually we are not sure, absolutely not sure yet how to use this new technology, how to, um, how is the, the, the best um, design thinking that uh, help us really to exploit this new technology in the best way. And this is, of course, I mean, uh, the story of every technology has, uh, is arriving in our society. So um, this is an interesting time for design and for architectures because of this. So we are testing and uh, experimenting what could be done with the new technology and new design thinking, a new uh, design method, new way of researching by designing. And this is uh, a little bit, uh, this is important, okay, to, um, of course, understand that um, our construction will change in the next years, thanks to experimental, current experimental design. Uh, in terms of shaping, um, how we shape, the second question. So, uh, yeah, okay, let me, <laughs> the second question, how we shape, um, the best person, to ask this, uh, is Mark Forens, which is an architect and designer, quite famous right now, so it's considered the god of scripting for architecture, for computational design. Um, uh, I asked him, so which is the, what is the value of uh, C, um, of taste and approach to a physical model, what we have designed it to, uh, to scripting, so just a few lines of code. And the, the answer was that, so it's, there's it's several strange processes they are um, taking off while you deal with uh, script-based design. The first is that with simple line, with few simple lines of codes, you can generate uh, an, an a huge amount of complexity. And the buildable, so the, the second process, if you want to build, to construct and produce this complexity generated within a computer, within a, um, a processors. So you have to put inside your human nature, your human brain, and understand how to break down this complexity to make, to physically make the, process, uh, the, the project happen. So how to build uh, a very complex, um, a very complex uh, space is generated by a script you have to uh, break it down and work a lot in order to create uh, a kind of uh, real algorithm that help you to build it. And this is a little bit how every designer works. So uh, the try design means um, try to simplify a, a complex uh, task. Um, the difference with uh, computational design, advanced design in general, is that there's a very complete, a, a true explorative approach uh, during um, doing in doing this. So um, mainly the 
task, the goal of com uh, computational design is to, is to evolve, to understand those technology I was talking before, and to um, evolve way of thinking, way of building, way of designing, So, which is quite uh, different from a traditional <laughs> designing design, design point of view. Where is the other? Um, in terms of how we manage, uh, the architect Daniel Dendra, which is a Berlin-based uh, designer involved in several uh, collaborative projects for architecture, um, we discussed about how collaboration, well, the sense of collaborations within design and architecture in general and planning. And uh, an interesting uh, point is that thanks to this long digital chain allowed by uh, all the, those new technology and digital tools, the digital chains created by the development of a project since the inception until uh, its completion uh, is very long and put inside thousands of new agents, more actors, uh, consultants, and so on. So it's quite difficult at the end. The, the, the great difference from, I mean, traditional, uh, I would say, architecture is that we have too many actors more. more. So uh, it's very difficult to detect who is the author of a project. So um, digital uh, in general is also in a way affecting this uh, sphere of design, so the authorship. But in a way it's also um, destroying a kind of uh, status quo of architects. And this is, I, uh, I think, very interesting in order to um, put more innovation in all the process uh, that are around the management of architectures. And this is a kind of overview I wanted to give on uh, experimental design. And I think that is all uh, in theory right now, so let's see uh, what will happen in the next years. <laughs> Okay, um, bring the word, the, the word again just to, um, just to tell you also about the, the other section, the first section, it's uh, chronologically the second one. But to give you also um, just a comment that I have in my mind, we, we, we decided to have also a freehand kind of presentation. So the first thing that I'm thinking about, it's also it's the very first time that I have the chance to do a presentation with the guys here. Uh, we, me and Bertrand, had a presentation just before in for the Open World Forum in uh, in Paris, but we were only me and you. So uh, you you can understand also really the different approach of the the, um, um, the theorists that created one of these sections. You know, so also they are different way of speaking, their different background. It's quite clear. Also, which are their main targets, the their ideas, how. Um, they were also completely independent in creating, you know, the single sections, giving completely their own approach. And even if it was not clear, it probably until now, it's, each section was divided in four sub um, texts. I mean, there is a, uh, an introduction text that we wrote by our hand, uh, an interview to um, a guru, or what we consider as a sort of a guru, or uh, someone that could give us uh, um, a different approach also to our idea of the main focus of the section itself. And um, the third text is, the, is, is an interview to a god of someone, <laughs> as Sabina said, what we consider a really important example you know, of what we are saying. And uh, the last section was a, a sort of case study um, in all sections focused on a French artist. This is important also to say because MCD is French, so we, we had to pay a due also to, to, to French, um, you know, artists and designers. But it's very interesting to see really this different approach. Uh, we don't have the chance to be here, uh, to have here Elena also that created the, 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 the audio section, but also from, from her studies and her approach to the section of sound, it's very clear also her background and uh, she has another different kind of language, another different kind of approach to this idea of open technologies. And um, about the section that I created together with Claudia D'Alonso, uh, we share this section together because we share some of many of our of these researchers connected to the use of um, to the use of video and audiovisuals. Um, 
we consider this section as probably also the sound sections, like a point of connection between um, the, the, the other three. Um, we felt this sort of responsibility because, um, because we easily could have the chance to focus uh, on the idea of aesthetics. That was, you know, the first and easier idea. Okay, let's use and let's speak about open technologies, open softwares mainly, and even also open hardware, but mainly open softwares. How the open softwares could um, intervene on the production of new aesthetics, you know, connected to the use of video and audio and audiovisuals. Um, we thought this was a good idea, of course, but we thought also that there are uh, more and more texts and interviews and publications about this stuff. So we wanted to shift a little bit this um, this, uh, this this target, this focus, being connected to to to, to the more uh, general idea of this uh, this publication. So we decided to to focus our attention on uh, on on the impact of open technologies more in general, not only the open software or free software, but the open technologies more in general on three points. Uh, on three main focuses, uh, creation, distribution, dissemination, and of course the fruition also of the audience, uh, of the audiovisual contents. The three ideas are basically important for us um, and was in our idea also interesting to find good uh, theorists that could give us also their feedback and their idea mainly focused on creation, fruition, and also dissemination of audiovisual contents today. And so we focus our intentions on, our, on some keywords that literally we gave by email to these people um, that are now I'm going to, to, to tell you who they are. And um, for, for example, the keyword of the use of the video archives Okay, this idea, the development of the importance of the video archives online, in which you can find a lot of also free and sometimes also uh, completely reshellable kind of audiovisual content. Um, some other keywords that I wrote down really randomly: um, the the, um, the presence also of video online platforms. And when I spoke about video, of course, it's an easier way to speak about audiovisual contents. Okay, what what many people say sometimes about multimedia content that are a completely stupid name. It's more uh, audiovisual content, okay? The possible connection between sound and video. And um, of course, we wanted to give attention to, the, to, the, to this idea of new networks of production. Uh, we are following network of production of audiovisual contents for many years. As you know, Digicut was ever connected also to the author that we consider for many years as a, a good example of this. They are doing this, what they do from 10 years, but now they are more actual probably done in the past. So this idea of uh, networking, creating, you know, uh, and producing um, audiovisual contents. Um, of course, there were some other delicate points like uh, the free licenses, for example, uh, the, the idea of the authorship, the idea of the intellectual property, and the idea also of uh, how um, the audiovisual content could be representative in a way of uh, um, the contemporary culture that is surrounding us today. So how the contemporary culture could be explained and could be in a way investigated through the use of audiovisual content. And uh, who is the guy, in our opinion, that in the world is doing the best researches in this direction? Mr. Lev Manovic, that you probably know. And uh, we commissioned to him um, a text uh, coming from uh, his, the researches that he has been doing uh, with a software studies initiative uh, project that you can find easily online. And um, he's doing a very uh, complicated, um, very, really very complex kind of uh, research using uh, what he called the, the so-called big data. So this, this so-called big amount of uh, data in terms of audiovisual data uh, coming from um, films, coming from uh, um, papers, coming from images taken from magazines, uh, from digital comics, coming also from comics, coming from what is uh, the visual contemporary culture um, spread it today in the society in which we live. And uh, using, of course, a special software, so using, of course, special kind of mathematical formula that uh, they are um, studying and researching at the Software Studies Initiative project, trying to understand also um, how a possible visualization 
okay, of this complex audiovisual data can be investigated and can be used okay, to explain and to give a visualization of the contemporary society in which we live. Of course, I'm not the best person to explain such a complex theory. The best thing that I can tell you is, first of all, to read uh, the article and especially to go online on uh, the Software Studies Initiative to understand exactly what they are doing really deep uh, in the deep. And um, it's also beautiful. We don't have time now, but it's also very interesting to go on the Flickr page. They are putting all these uh, big images on Flickr page. The cover of the magazine is, is an example of a page. All these are small um, frames that you maybe can see. Maybe it's easier. We can see from, from here. And um, all these small frames that you can see here are frames taken uh, second by second, probably also with a, yeah. Okay, second by second from the same movie, I don't remember absolutely which is the name of the movie, are also frames, only frames of the movie, uh, searching with particular specific parametric softwares, which could be the possible connection in terms of aesthetics. This is, all these images is turned to gray, for example. So um, focusing on aesthetics, focusing on, um, on special um, uh, paradigm that are um, completely inside. The, 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 the audiovisual content they are focusing in, they try to have this sort of visualization that could be uh, representative and could be um, a sort of explanation also of the society in which we are living on many different point of views, especially starting from an aesthetical point of view. This is also one of the questions that we sent to Lev Manovich, try to shift a little bit his also perspective and to, um, to try to understand also if the theories that he is applying, okay, in the idea of culture, can be applied also on the idea of art and creativity more in general. Uh, he gave an interesting answer, not completely um, focused in a way, but it's it's interesting. It's an open discussion. Um, the second example that we decided to to focus is a more classical and um, is um, the the. Uh, founder and director of Ubu Web, maybe you know the platform online, and uh, he he's uh, an American poet called Kenneth Goldsmith, um, a very funny guy. And um, in that case, um, in that case, we decided to focus on more simple questions in a way. So the idea of authorship, the idea of how it's possible that a platform like that one is. Uh, in which all these contents are completely copyleft and completely free online. It's a really important tool for researchers and for people researching in experimental cinema. How is possible that the platform is still there, was not closed in the last year, and so how, um, which, is, which is in a way the difference of sharing content uh, covered by copyright and which is also the difference uh, sharing other kind of contents which are not covered by uh, copyright that are free in a way, shareable in a way, and um, that, le that give less attention in a way to the, uh, to the big companies you know, of uh, uh, multimedia distributions online. Uh, so also this, um, this idea of uh, a politic impact of the open technologies, I think it's also another feel rouge, another point of connection between the different, bet between the different sections. And um, the, last, the last text that we wrote is a case study, and um, it's a called the Barcode Project. And um, in our opinion, it was a good case study because it uh, was uh, a big uh, project commissioned by a big institution in French, uh, in French and uh, connected to the Board of Canada. So it's a, a big, big project in which these uh, big institutions put a lot of money uh, to create these online platforms in which every one of us creating audiovisual content could share Okay, this audiovisual content on the platform, and this uh, this content could be connected to some objects existing in the in the real life, and the people could join this audiovisual content created mainly by unknown people, completely unknown people that had the chance, of course, to show their project, connected to physical objects uh, distributed in the city of Paris, and, and, uh, and the people taking photos and uh, being in contact with this physical object could join on their mobile phones, uh, you know, the audiovisual content created by such unknown people. So in our opinion, it was also a good, interesting case study because, first of all, because um, 
a good project produced and funded by a big institutions. And this is also the idea, and this is also one of the questions that I want to give also to the other guys here, um, which could be also the future, you know, in a way. If we, it, it was fun because when we decided also the title, you know, the open future, uh, we decided this title one year ago. Okay, the, this project started one year ago. And, uh, and we say after one year, it's still considerable to have a title like the open future. Which future? The open technologies are not something in the future. Open technologies are here today. So why we have to call about future? And this was a very important point, and probably it's a point that I don't know if we have the chance to develop in such a few pages in a way. Probably it's something that it's better to discuss about. So my question also to, the, to you is, uh, what could further happen in the future? I mean, because yeah, this 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 point of the title has been a nightmare for us for uh, for for. Uh, I, I'm afraid it's two years now yeah. Uh, yeah, that we started to, to to work on this two years ago. Uh, the point is is that somehow um, there is a, 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 um, a misunderstanding talking with some people about about the title because it's not strictly on a work on on open source technologies, but it's more on on here open means open to something. That means um, probably a, a good title. We sometimes we we spend. Uh, our dinners think about which could be the real title of of, of the work uh, could be the, the 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 process because the point is that here probably watch uh, the fil rouge between all the sections is the the, the shift from uh, product to process in contemporary culture uh, because here the thing is that okay we have so many um, new approaches in art, science, design, music, and whatever, uh, that basically reshape the idea of, of, of uh, what people is doing, and uh, the, the final product is usually is unknown, as you, as you underlined before, um, is uh, open to many possible different futures, that's the point, to many possible different results. And uh, the point is that people is doing this kind of things because they are interested in doing it. And they usually don't really know what could be the final results in terms of, of, of product. It will be a house, it will be uh, an object, it will be uh, a new uh, living form, it will be a new audiovisual work. Nobody really knows, but the point is that uh, Everybody's working on the process. And he, this is also the reason why all, all uh, uh, these fields are so highly uh, interdisciplinary. Because, OK, there are some very heavy specializations. For example, Norbert Pals, uh, it's heavily focused on material production and design. But at the same time, uh, also the, the people working in, in what can we see as a field, more or less, of open uh, open futures? Uh, is people moving toward, uh, moving from art to design to science? They are at the same time researchers, activists. They are professionals. They are journalists. They are storytellers. So it's very uh, hard to 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 understand this kind of processes, uh, this kind of stories, if we focus only on the product, because the very uh, core of everything is the process uh, with people. Uh, that, that people is using to do things. Should I add something? Um, yeah, well, but the point is that we, uh, we know the process works. It really depends on how you apply it to different fields and different, different uh, fields of, of knowledge and information or even material production. Uh, another, point, another point for me is that working, is that uh, it's not only a technical process, it's also like a political, there's a politics of openness. So for example, it, it depends on other things that we, that we can't predict right now. We, we, can, we can just act and try and hope and try to, uh, to work for a more open future. So I want to, I'm, I'm thinking here about, uh, well, public policies, for example, so open licenses, that's not it is, a, it is a technical point in a way, but then it, it's also very, very. It's, a, it's also political battleground. Uh, business models: Will people uh, 
give up some of their um, well-established business models in order to risk more on, on more open business models, for example. That's, that's not to be taken for granted. Uh, uh, the culture of openness, so this, this really depends, depends on, for example, on social movements. Will, will new movements emerge that work with technology and try to push it to, towards more open futures? That's, that's, that's to be, to be, to be uh, and this, that's not clear yet. So I think there's also politics of openness that we should take into account. I don't want to, don't want to open this field too much because it will be too open, but uh, it, I think it's a very important point that, that goes way beyond the technicality of all this. Any question? <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, the first question comes from a tweet, a tweet from Antonio Rollo. Hi, Antonio. Thank you for following us. Antonio asks, in a world in which we are substitute the, the memory, biological memory, with the digital memory. How the perception, the perception uh, sorry, of the reality, how uh, it change? Uh, this is a million questions, one million questions. <laughs> no, it's an interesting question, but uh, probably I will reframe it in another way, Chad. The point is that, um, uh, Probably we are not uh, substituting our perception of reality, it's a matter of reframing it because as, for example, uh, all the studies on the philosophy of mind in, during uh, the past century uh, clearly shown how, uh, I mean, each human brain is basically substituting the physical reality to a system uh, with a system of symbols that somehow it's fake, so uh, it's fake. It's produce it. So it's, it, it's symbolic. So uh, I think that it's a bit, uh, it, it's tricky to talk about reality as something that is objectual and uh, that the pre-internet pre uh, approach was able to, to, to leave, to, 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 uh, to get involved with. Simply technology here, it's another frame of uh, interaction uh, with the world that is outside, but it's, it's almost, it, it, it's still unknowable as it was at the very beginning. Technology is simply another tool. It's also another, it's only another level of, of, of symbols. That's my view. Okay, just because you answered it, I would like to make a question to Alessandro Delfanti, because uh, uh, you said that uh, a lot of people, researchers, but also common people, are putting their hands into life, in a way. And so, is there a sort of uh, movement of uh, biomaker uh, growing on? Uh, yes, yes, there is this... Uh, there is this global network, let's say, that's, that's, that's called DIY Bio, do-it-yourself biology, and it was, it was born, it was founded uh, four years ago in the US, but since then it has, it has expanded, uh, all of, 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 let's say, all over the US and then to basically Europe, partially South America and Southeast Asia, basically. Um, it is an informal network, so you can just you know, take their, their brand and use it for, for your purposes, more or less. The point is to, to build this network, this informal network of both spaces. So biohacker spaces, again, I, I introduced the, the, that uh, before. So you have now, like in Europe, you have like, I want to say six, seven uh, spaces that are, that, are, that are working right now and that, that allow people to experiment with, with, with life in this uh, like more open way. Uh, and even more in the US and, and some in Asia. Uh, and then apart from that, you have this, this, this movement of people uh, trying to, 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 to conduct experiments and so on in their, houses, in, in their houses. It is not productive from the scientific viewpoint right now, so they're not doing any good science. They're not innovating, they're not producing this new knowledge that's going to be published in nature. So that, that's not their point, I guess. The point is that, again, it's, it's, it's about the process. So they are building 
spaces both online and offline uh, open to public participation. But yeah. Um, I really like your term, advancity. And I, I think it's important. I think it was a mistake to call modernity, modernity. Because it just gets older and older. Then you have to talk about early modernity, middle modernity, late modernity. And then you've got post-modernity. And now we've got like post-post-modernity. And you know, the words are just breaking down. It doesn't, it's like old-fashioned post-modernity. It just language is shattered. And I kind of like advancity because it's, I don't know, it just, it just has a kind of sexy feeling to it and makes a distinction between what we have now and what went before. But I wonder, do you have an idea how long advancity will last? Like, what's the lifespan of advancity if post-modernity is like, I don't know, 1975 to 2001? I mean, when did advancity stop, start? And when do you expect it to end? And what do you think would come after it? And I hope it's not post-advancity. Right? Why not? This may be the first time I think about this <laughs> question. <laughs> when do you think it started? When it started? The first year when it was happening. Has it not happened yet? Like it's happening, I think. So there is, it's still in the experimental fields. No, since April. It started, I think, yeah, in a way when, for example, several university was like uh, producing thousands so more programs about advanced design, for example, and a, a growing number of students were uh, uh, were agreeing to pay thousands, so huge amount of money to go study this stuff. So I think this is already a signal that uh, advancity means something, is business, is something that can make future. So I think in terms of design, I'm uh, quite convinced that advancity started thanks to university, in a way, when digital advanced programs uh, became the, the, the most important thing you can do in university. And when it will finish, oh God. So um, I don't know, I think we have still to define what it means, advanced city, because right now for us, cer uh, certain tools are advanced, but uh, I mean, they will be not always advanced. So there is a still a, a part of population that uh, it's not um, conscious about so, I mean, population, and I'm talking about in design, which is not really um, conscious about what is happening in terms of construction and whatever. And so there's still a big difference between who is working in a way, traditional way, and who is working with advanced tools. So actually, some people say, some people working in advanced design thinks that uh, this is not the only future we will have in design. So not all the design in the future will be conceived as advanced design or something like that. Others think that this is the future. So some visionary realities produced by architects are really, really something that has nothing to do with how we are uh, used to see cities and architecture and human habitats. So I think that... Um, there is, so advancity is something that can all, all, all or become the normality for everybody and then start to, maybe after advancity will be a sustainable future or, uh, or maybe it will be just a part of the society or design society that will take a direction and we'll still believe it. I believe that uh, it will be the future, so that in a way everybody will, will go to work in an advanced way. Can you help me in this answer? <laughs> I think, uh, I think the, the, um, 
the general tension of this whole publication from the very um, from the very original idea was to was to have this very difficult balance you know what between what is happening today and what could happen tomorrow. That was a very delicate balance and uh, it's a sort of a tension that we had in all our sections uh, uh, from our discussions, I think. Because, of course, questions like this one, I, uh, I, I had another one in Paris very similar to this one, that uh, a guy from the audience called me, which is the future of art, and I say, come on, man, I don't know, you know, it's, we are here, we are, I don't know, we can discuss about it, you know. So um, the, the very general tension of this publication is this one. We wanted to have a focus on what is happening today that, as Sabina said, is something that probably um, a not high percentage of people that could read uh, a publication like this one have a general clear idea on what is happening today concerning the open technologies. And in the same time, we wanted to have also um, this kind of a vision, asking help, of course, from the people that we invited to, to write on, on the publication what could be also the further developments of, um, you know, of the disciplines in which we are involved. And personally, even if we didn't touch so much this point uh, in the publication, but we, we touched in many other kind of discussions like this one. Personally, another very important point is also con con connected, for example, on the developments of, of new kind of economies. So how could be also the connection between the use of the open technologies, the application and distribution of open technologies connected to different disciplines that could be design architecture, could be uh, audiovisual production, can be music, can be also, of course, internet and can be science in a way, uh, which could be also the impact of a development of new kind of economies that maybe follow you know, some kind of chains that are not so traditional as in the past, that doesn't depend from institutions anymore, or uh, can try to find, you know, also in terms of production and distribution of contents, can find eventually also some other directions, you know, so not so straight in a way, maybe a little bit more um, fragmented that in a way can use um, the idea of platform, the idea of a new kind of processes, the idea of new kind of softwares, the idea of new kind of networking activities also to have an impact of a possible new kind of economies. And also that's another important point that we didn't have the chance to touch add something. too much here. I thought a little bit also about one interesting and important point linked to advanced design. So that's this um, Reapproach with nature. So all these computational tools, whatever they are able to mimic, to um, take some uh, a lot of the natural behavior, uh, the pr natural process behavior, and put it in our production. So it's a way that, in a way, reapproach human with nature. And uh, actually, this could be uh, a goal, like if, if an end to a, a goal of advancity to arrive with the new equilibrium and relation between man and nature. Um, this is also a possible uh, future that we can see. So where advancity is going to put nature and man more close.
that in social networks, you know, and it's very popular. I mean, you got an app that lights right at your desk. But probably, probably in another, in another, from another point of view, what we consider advanced, or what I personally consider advanced, is not the development of necessarily of a new technologies. I don't care about social networks. I care how I can use social network in a more responsible way, and how I can create something in terms of production, distribution, creation of economy. How can I survive in the world doing the things that I do, using eventually yeah. technologies that I don't consider advanced at all costs, but it's my so way of approaching the technologies that is changing. Is it a social attitude, or is it like a state of material culture? I think it's a state of material culture. It's both. Probably. Or I both. Mean, or maybe both. You, 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 you can't have a state of material culture without, without a certain social frame and economic network. So. Yeah, in fact, uh, j just to close, just to yeah. close yeah, the, yeah. The, the speech, <laughs> connecting also to the question that Bruce did uh, to the speakers. Uh, personally, I think that, uh, for example, also connected to what Marco said about the research of, of Levmanovic, I think that we could say we would be really in, in a, this kind of advanced period when uh, uh, using computational tools like uh, Manovich is doing, applied to arts, culture, and uh, I mean to humanities, uh, when this kind of uh, bridge will be, will be uh, easily for everyone to, to do it, I, I would say that we would uh, uh, go on another period, how can I say? And, uh, uh, for example, uh, as Marco said, the computational tools that uh, Levmanov is, is using is an interesting uh, site on, inside these uh, new methodologies.